invite you to open your Bible to the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 4, and uh, we'll read uh, some pieces out of chapter 4 and chapter 5, so we don't have to read the whole chapters. I've kind of spliced and diced there, but um, hope, hoping that we can get the theme of what's going on. Acts is the story of the early church as uh, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, tell the story, the ministry of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. Then the book of Acts begins with the starting of the church and how the church spread and uh, and grew. And so hear this uh, as the church is just beginning. Acts chapter 4 will begin at verse 1. Read along with me if you would. It says, The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and to John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. I'm going to skip down a little bit. Peter and John uh, end up witnessing to these religious leaders who have arrested them, and this is what happens down at verse 18. It says, then they called them in again. And commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to God? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. Then they they go back, they're released from prison, they go back, they join with the other Christians and they all share in a prayer together and and a part of their prayer is that that God would consider the threats that are being made against them and that God would enable them to speak even more boldly. And so skip down to chapter 5 with me in verse 17, it says, Then the high priest and all of his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees, they were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But, bur- but during the night, an angel of the Lord appeared and opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told, and they began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and they sent to the jail for the apostles. Guess what? They didn't find them there. So skip down a little bit more with me to verse 25. It says, Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail, they're standing in the temple courts and teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles 
They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you're determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. However, they just flog them and then they don't, they don't kill them, they let them go. And it says down in verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Would you pray with me? O oh God, as the rain falls upon the earth, we pray that you would fall upon us, that your dewdrops of mercy would fall upon our souls, bringing life, that living water into us. O oh God, blanket us with Cover us with your goodness and allow us to be saturated with yourself. Oh God, speak in this place. Anoint my voice that my, my words would carry your spirit, that they would be your words spoken from your mouth and then make our ears, our hearts, and our minds ready to receive you. Oh God, we pray these things hoping to hear from you, hoping to be changed and made new, made ready to go and give ourselves away for somebody else. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You know, for all of our Christian lives, we've been told that we need to do evangelism. We, we have to do evangelism. We, we have to get out and, and share the gospel. We have to do evangelism, or hopefully you've been told that. And so this has probably become our reaction. Oh no, not evangelism, right? And perhaps, perhaps that is our reaction because maybe, maybe when we picture evangelism and think about what it means to do that and think about what, what that's calling us to go and to do, maybe this is a little bit of what we think it looks like. Somebody with a bullhorn on the corner saying, repent or you're going to hell or do you know where you will spend eternity and it seems to lack an element of love or grace or goodness. It seems to be centered around judgment and fear and, and, and struggle. Or maybe, maybe when we think of evangelism, maybe we think of something like this. Evangelism, we must go share the good news because we've got to get more people into our church. I mean, it's looking a little light today. We've got to get some more people in here or else our church is going to die. We've got to go share the good news so that we can have some more bodies in this place. But here's the deal, my friend. We've got this evangelism thing all wrong. That's why it feels so wrong. Because we've got it all wrong, or at least mostly wrong. See, these, these images of evangelism, they're not what the early church was engaged in. This isn't what the apostles we're doing. The apostles didn't stand on corners, beating, berating pedestrians and chariots, wearing them out, warning them about hell. Fear of hell is never, in fact, mentioned in these lengthy texts that I just read from. The apostles weren't shouting at uninterested masses. Instead, they were going from house to house, person to person, people that they'd meet in the temple courts, sharing with them this good news. 
And their goal wasn't just to bring people into their church. It wasn't getting people to, to follow their theology or give to their cause. But there was something else. Something else that was more important. And I'll circle back in a, in a little while to what that something else is. But, but first I want to look at the why. Why is it that the apostles are doing this? Why is it that sharing this good news is so important? I mean, this, this has all the makings of a Wild West showdown here in this text. The apostles standing on one side and the, the religious leaders standing on the other, staring each other down eye to eye with, with those twitchy fingers, just waiting to see who might flinch first, who might decide that the stakes are too high and we should back down before things get a little too real. The religious leaders here, they want to kill the apostles. They, they arrest them, they flog them, they jail them, they beat them, they berate them. And if it weren't for the sentiments of the crowds, they would flat out kill them. And on the other side, standing there, are the apostles. They're some of the world's worst criminals because they keep going back and doing the exact same things in the exact same places. Do you notice that? I mean, it's never a problem for the authorities to find them because they keep going to the same place. Let me, let me tell you how it goes. I'll summarize it real quick. They're in the temple area, in the temple courts, and the religious leaders go and they, they arrest them, they, they threaten them, and then they let them go. So the apostles, they go back to the temple courts again, go back to that same place, Solomon's colonnade. Then, then they begin to speak even more boldly about this good news. So they're arrested again. During the night, an angel shows up and an angel breaks them out of jail. The angel says, hey, go stand in the temple courts. Tell the people about this new life. Now, I don't know about you, but if an angel ever busts me out of jail and tells me, go back to the scene of the crime, I'm going to say, seriously? But they do it. They go back. They go back to the temple courts, right back to Solomon's colonnade again. They stand there again. They teach again. And they're arrested again. This time the religious leaders, they beat them, they threaten them some more, and then they let them go again. And it says that the apostles rejoice. They rejoice, they give thanks to God because they're counted worthy of suffering for God. And that is the good news. You know, I wonder, I wonder what is it that could make us so passionate so convicted, so on fire, and, and wanting to, to do something like this, to, to throw ourselves back into that lion's and to, to, to go back into that fire time after time after time. What is it that could cause us to be, to be countered uh, among the criminals and those who are breaking the law and, and doing these things that others are saying is wrong? What is it that could ignite that fire within us? You know, I think it would have to be something that was totally life-changing. It would have to be something that, that, that made such a difference down in our soul that, that it transformed everything about us. I thought it might be appropriate this morning to tell you a story, a little story about a flood that was coming. Somehow the, the world became aware that, that there was a flood that was coming and it was going to come within the next decade. And so it caused a, a bit of a panic. People started getting worked up over this and, and fearful. In fact, doctors started noticing that there was tremendous spikes in people's blood pressures because the, the scientists and others were predicting this flood. They said, it is going to be all-encompassing. It's going to be the whole world. It's going to be terrible, catastrophic. We don't know what to do about it. And so people started having higher blood pressure and having other health-related problems. In fact, some people were even dying from the sheer stress of thinking about this coming flood. Then it got worse because panic began to take over the earth. People began battling and killing each other for boats and for supplies. Nations went to war against other nations, jockeying for power, trying to make sure that their people, that they had what they needed. It became a, a power struggle between the, the haves and the have-nots and everyone was at war with each other. There were other people who, who began to flee in fear. They started hiding wherever they could find a, a, a safe place. 
It was a miserable existence. Life was awful and chaos reigned. But in the middle of this terrible madness, in the middle of this, this terrible existence, a man named Jesus. And Jesus heard God's voice. Jesus heard God whispering to him, and this was the message that God whispered. He said, storms and floods will come, but trust me, I will never let you down. I will never let you drown. I will never let you die. I will save you. Now, this assurance was so very calming to Jesus that it brought peace into his soul, such a peace that he began to live his life differently. Jesus no longer feared this coming flood. He no longer was worried about the rioting and the fighting around him. He he, he no longer hid in fear and, and stressful worry. Instead, he lived. He began to live life. He had, he had hope and he had joy and he had peace and he had love. And Jesus rediscovered life, an abundant life. But as he saw his friends and, and his world still perishing in pain, he couldn't help but share the good news that he had heard. He couldn't help but, but, but hope that that seed might be planted in others, that they could find this hope, this way of finding life, this, this way of living and, and not co- uh, being co-opted into all of the struggle and the pain and the death and, and all of the, the, the darkness around that was enveloping his world. And so he began to, to share that good news with others. God loved You, God cares about you. God will not let you die. Floods may come, but God will never let you drown. Jesus devoted his life to sharing this good news. But some people became jealous of him and they actually killed him. However, our God was faithful. And God raised Jesus from the dead, gave him new life. My friends, evangelism isn't about pushing people into something they don't want to do. It's not about getting people onto our team. Evangelism is sharing good news. It's giving the gift of life. Real life. Giving life to to people who are struggling and who are dying, to people who are just the walking dead, not even able to live anymore because they've been so overtaken by the darkness. It's giving a gift to somebody else because we realize what a life change that it has brought to us. And I want that, I yearn that for somebody else. As Acts says, Peter and John were proclaiming a resurrection from the dead. That's not just about Jesus Christ. It is for sure, but not just about Jesus Christ. In other words, they're saying, their message is this, that that something that brings life, they're carrying something that brings life to those who are dead or are dying. My friends, do you think that anybody is dying today? Do you think that that anybody is dying in a a dead-end, meaningless existence? Do you think that anybody is caught just in the the hamster wheel cycle and and it never seems to end and we just feel like we are running towards the grave? Do Do you think that anybody is dying in fear today, living scared of what may come tomorrow, living scared of what the world may come get them with in the next thing, living scared and like we need more safety and more security. Do you, do you think that anybody is dying today, dying in the failures of our past, dying in the ways that we messed up, dying in the background that we carry with us into today? Do you think 
that anybody is dying in the pursuit of money, just giving all they have, but never having enough. My friends, do you think that anybody is dying in a way of living that's killing themselves, anybody that is, that is addicted and chained to those things to the point of destroying their own life? Do you think that anybody is dying today because they're, they're sure that there's nothing beyond this life? Do you think that anybody is dying today because they feel like they will never get to see their loved ones again? beyond the grave my friends is there anybody anybody in our world who is dying today they desperately need some good news if only if only somebody would share with them would you pray with me God, we thank you for life, for life that endures beyond the fire, for life that survives through the flood. We thank you for life that, that bears us up upon the waters, that baptizes us with a presence that can never be taken from us. We thank you, O oh God, for a life that conquers death. And so God, for these gifts that you have placed within us, we pray for a courage, for a passion, for an understanding of what we have been given. Oh God, send us out as those who have these great treasures, these, these needs that so many other people are dying to have. God, help us to share this goodness with somebody else who's struggling and dying this week. We pray for courage in the name of Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, Amen.